excuse me, her sister is married to my brother. That doesn't speak wise of her sister, but we do love we do love her, and she is like a a, a sister figure uh, to us. And Julie, many pastors buy the lie that you can't get close to your people. I have found that to be a lie because if you're the same person in private as you are in public, there's nothing to fear. And what I love about Brother and Sister to Priest is they are the same people at Cracker Barrel as they are in the house of the Lord today. Julie and I uh, have had many ups and downs as many couples have in marriage. I do remember a distinct period. We were at Murfreesboro doing what we could do for the Lord there. And uh, many pastor's wives have to be the potentate of everything decorated and, and ladies' department and everything. Sister DePriest never felt that way, and she exemplified her passion was teaching. She almost always was teaching a class, usually college and career, if I'm not mistaken. But she also prayed, and so I would love to tell you that I was getting up at 4 o'clock, hitting the prayer room because it was my natural habit. I can tell you it was because I was going through a crisis. And what was amazing to me, a woman who was working a full-time job, pastor's wife of a very successful church, found her way to the sanctuary to have early morning prayer before she commuted to work. That left an indelible impression on my mind. I can hear platitudes, I can hear lessons, I can see great swelling words and large offerings, but nothing speaks to my heart is what people do when they think nobody's watching. And I just want you to know that uh, this sister is a credible voice about prayer, not, not these great prayer journals of great swelling words, but practical prayer that makes a difference and brings joy to those who experience it. Amen? Did I do okay? Did I, did I read the way you wrote it? I'm just kidding. Now, please don't be a, a clock watcher because we're very gracious with your time, but we do have a special guest. I know she's not very long-winded. We're not going to push you for a five-hour altar call today. We do want to hear you. We would want to hear the voice of the Lord challenge us in the air of prayer. If you know God is able to speak, would you give Sister DePriest a hand as she comes to the Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. We want to honor the Sadlers today. It is Pastor's Appreciation Month. Did you know that? Yeah. We're so proud of them. And this morning I've been asked, and I'm glad to do this, been asked to honor your pastor's wife, Sister Julie Sadler. <laughs> I met uh, Sister Sadler in 1987 at my sister's wedding. And um, I have a great story, but I'm going to let her share it. <laughs> Someday, you ask her and she'll say, I didn't know how beautiful she was really at the time, and she is a beautiful woman. But Julie possesses the one quality, and I often use her as an example to ministers' wives. She possesses the one quality that I tell every ministry wife, you must have. You must have it, and it must be number one. She loves her husband, and she submits to his God-given authority in her life. Thank you, Julie. She has other qualities, faithfulness, talent, intelligence, <laughs> and that's pretty evident, but she possesses the most important one. I know that if she had her choice in life, she probably wouldn't have chose to plan a church. <laughs> but she loved the man who had the call, and she submitted. And I could stand here today and tell you of many ministries that, were, that failed because a wife. This one possesses it. She loves her husband, and she submits to the call in his life. Julie, I honor you. I'm sorry. Sister Sadler, I honor you for every sacrifice, every hour of service, every lost hour of sleep, every heartbreak. We honor you today. Could you give her a hand? This is not my moment. This is Sister DePriest's time, but just know that 
It's embarrassing. I don't like to have accolades. <laughs> Y'all know that. You guys are awesome. This church is awesome because of you, not because of us. But I do love my husband. I do love my husband. I really do. And I am submitted. And I love you. And I love Brother and Sister the Priest. You guys are awesome. I bless you. Bless you. Isn't it wonderful to be in the family of God? Woo! It's the greatest life. It's the greatest life. God bless you. You may be seated. And boy, I do, do want to do a roll call right now. I'm telling you, I'm really fighting, but I see that clock. I love so many people in this room. Sister Diane, it's so good to see you. We went to church in the basement on Spring Street together. I tell you, God's been good. He's been good. He's been good. He's a great God. But we need, no, we need to get into this. Years of parenting, years of grandparenting, maybe a few years of pastoring, helped me discover a truth about people. <laughs> and, hey, probably about myself. You can give us positives all day long. You know what I mean? You can give us the positive all day long. Behave, and you'll have an easier life. I used to tell my youngest son that. If you'll just behave, <laughs> life would be so easy. You wouldn't believe how easy it would be, Tyler. <laughs> how about eat healthy, and you'll feel better? Don't we know that? We know that positive. Work hard, budget, and someday you'll have something. We know that. <laughs> but some of us, we have trouble responding to those positives, don't we? Reinforcing statements. We need some good old negatives. <laughs> How about you misbehave, buddy, and you're going to suffer the consequences? Why did that work? Or, you know, some of us ate chocolate all day, you know, had a bellyache that night. <laughs> we needed a few negatives to realize this may not be good for me. We skipped work or school, blew our money, get a little taste of poverty. You know, what does Pastor Sadler call it? Stupid tax. How many of us had to learn the hard way? Yeah. Some of us have to learn the hard way. We hear and read and hear and read and hear and read and pastor preaches and teaches and we still sometimes need to turn the page over and look at the cold hard facts. And folks, here's the cold hard fact. Prayer is life or death. Prayer is life or death death. Someone once said prayer is the breath of the human soul. Well, I'm here to tell you if breath is the prayer, if prayer is the breath of the human soul, some of our souls aren't breathing. And you know what that means. No breathe, no live. If sin is separation from God, and prayer is relationship with God. I hope I can convince you today that our prayerlessness is sin. Prayerlessness is sin. The Christian discipline of prayer may be the most difficult of all the Christian disciplines. And probably if you're in here today, some of the guilt you have experienced as a Christian is probably in that arena, lack of of prayer. It probably causes more guilt than any other area of our walk with God. How many of you had to read Pilgrim's Progress? Oh my goodness, what a work. John Bunyan, the author of that, he was known for his godliness, his knowledge of the scripture. He was known for his powerful preaching, and you know what he said? He said, I want to speak about my own experience and tell you the difficulty of praying to God as I should. He said, when I go to prayer, I find sometimes I am reluctant to go to God. And when I'm with him, I'm reluctant to stay with him. And many times I am forced in my prayers, first to beg God that he would take my heart and set it on him. And when it's there, that he would keep it there. 
Many times I know not what to pray, for I am so blind, nor, ha- nor know how to pray. I am so ignorant. Only the Spirit helps my infirmity. I hope today that instead of being shocked by that confession of John Bunyan, I hope that maybe you can relate a little bit to it. None of us have perfected prayer. We're all followers. We're all students of Christ, always learning until our last breath. I believe this is a praying church, but I also know your flesh like I am. I know that you know the positive results of prayer, but today I'm going to take the negative approach, and you can see it on the screen. Today I want to speak just a little while about why we don't pray, why we don't pray. I feel one reason we don't pray is we question if God really hears us. I've had people ask me, does prayer really make a difference? Is prayer that important? Is uh, God going to do what he's going to do anyway? Those are questions I have been asked. You guys are getting really quiet. That almost sounds sacrilegious, doesn't it? 2 Kings 19 tells the story of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king of Judah. He took the throne when he was 25 years old. His father had been a wicked king, but he had a good mother, and he had a prophet, Isaiah, in his life. Now, that will preach, but that's another lesson. The Assyrian king in this chapter sent a letter to Hezekiah. Now, If you don't remember it, please sometime go back and read the story. But he sent a letter to Hezekiah, and he said, I'm busy conquering the world, and you're next. And your God can't save you, and I'm that powerful, and if you know what's good for you, you just surrender. Now, that's southern. You'll read it maybe in the King James Version. (laughs) I love what Hezekiah did. I love what Hezekiah did. He took that letter from the Assyrian king. He took it to the house of God. He laid it on the floor, and he said, see, God, what he's saying? See what he's saying? He prayed. He read the threats to God. He admitted. He said, God, they are powerful. And then basically he said, save us, God. And you know what happened? God responded to Hezekiah's prayer. The Bible tells us an angel struck the camp of the Assyrian army and 185,000 people died. And the best words in this story are the words God spoke to Hezekiah in chapter 19, verse 20 of 2 Kings. Basically, God said, you see it there on the screen, but what did God say? He said, you prayed, I heard. Thank you, Jesus. I feel confident in saying today, if Hezekiah had not prayed, God would not have acted. In the story of Lazarus in the New Testament being raised from the dead, Jesus tells us that God always hears. John 11, verses 41 through 42. Would you read it with me? They took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I... Keep reading. (laughs) Don't forget that verse, folks. God always hears. He always hears. He does care. Many times in my prayer time, I repeat these. They're words of Jesus. Use them in your prayer. I say, thank you, God. You always hear me. I know you always hear me when I feel like you don't hear me. I know that my feelings aren't facts. I had to preach to myself sometimes. I know that my feelings aren't facts. Your word is fact. And your word says you always hear me. Stop wearing yourself out trying to fight your battles on your own. Pray and let the Lord do it. He always hears. 
I want to share an experience my husband had, um, and I'm so thankful for him. We don't understand a lot of things, but I know God is great. Isn't he great? Amen. Case and our oldest grandson, in fact, he's six years old today. He was spending the night with us when he was a toddler, and we were trying. Any grandparents in the house? We were trying to obey his parents. Give us a break. That is sometimes the hardest thing to do. They told us, they said, you read him a bed, you pray with him, you kiss him goodnight, you put him in the crib, and you close the door. I was like, <sighs> it was going splendidly until we closed the door. <laughs> Kaysen began to cry, and y'all, it was heart-wrenching. My husband goes by the name Da, and from that bedroom, there were wails. Da! 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 It was, it was killing us. Phil said, I'm getting him. I said, no, remember the kids said, and they're going to ask us if we did what. If, if, and you remember last time when they came to pick him up and we didn't put him to bed and we were in trouble. You remember that? I said, you, you know, we're going we're gonna to do what they said. So I left. I went upstairs. I said, I can't bear to hear it. can't bear to hear it. Watch the clock. I can't give it a certain amount of time. Then I was going to be disobedient. <laughs> came back down the stairs. And there were no case and cries. I cracked the door, peeked in, and he was sound asleep. It's amazing to me how he could be wailing like that one minute, <laughs> sound asleep the next. But the thing that gripped my heart, and baby, remember this, Phil was sitting on the floor outside the door, tears just streaming down his face. I said, are you okay? <laughs> I mean, I know that was hard, but <laughs> that's a little ridiculous. He looked at me and he said, it broke my heart. Because God spoke to me and he said, Phil, this is how I feel. When you cry out. And buddy, there's never been a time that you cried that I didn't hear. Yeah. Folks, today our Heavenly Father always, always, always hears us. It may be yes, it may be no, it may be you have to wait. But God always hears yeah. He always gives us what's best for us. If we don't understand, if we don't see it, if Ruth and Naomi had not lost their husbands, there would not have been a King David. I'm not discounting your loss, but I'm telling you, God always hears, and he always does. He All things do work together for good to those who love the Lord. Another reason we don't pray, and, you know, lightning really might strike this time, but we don't pray because we don't think we really need God. Maybe it's because of advances in science. You know, my grandmother used to love to tell me the story. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer. They had ten kids. If he didn't work, they didn't eat. Um, he fell sick. Uh, he went to bed, and that was sick. And they couldn't call the doctor. They didn't know about doctors much back then. She called for the elders of the church. If you know Sister Jean Hayslip from Murfreesboro, her father, Lee Lorn, was called. Or they went and got him. They didn't have telephone. They went and got him. And you know what? I think we don't, you know, when we get sick, you know, we can call an ambulance or, you know, go to the doctor or whatever. But she called for the elders of the church. Brother Lohorn came, and my grandmother tells it this way. She says, he laid hands on your papa, and he comes shouting out of that bed. He shouted all over the room, and she said, I was chasing behind him, trying to hitch his overalls back on. <laughs> Maybe it's because we live in a world of skeptics. Doubt is everywhere. 
In fact, it's glorified. I've seen the T-shirt you probably have, too, that says, question everything. Prosperity, maybe. Maybe that's what's diluting our prayers. We have, it's hard to pray. Give us this day our daily bread when, you know, the pantry's stocked and full. We've been to third world countries where people actually pray. They don't have resources. They don't have insurance. They don't have retirement plans. And I don't know why today, but I feel I need to mention this too. We live in a culture that has all kinds of therapists, all kinds of support groups, and I am not opposed to that. We actually have some of those through our church. But if praying, and please, somebody hear me today, if praying to an invisible God is replaced by flesh and blood folks that can nod their head and pat your hand, you're telling God, I don't need you. We need God. Second Kings f- chapter 5 tells us of Naaman. He was a great man, and he didn't need anything until leprosy showed up. And then because he was willing to humble himself and submit to God, he was healed. Throughout the Psalms, David cries, God, I need you. Safety, sanity, salvation. Only God was his very present help. My dad was a good man. There wasn't a better man as far as just being a good man. Faithful husband. He was a faithful father, a friend to many. He he lived clean. He worked hard. When I was growing up, I thought my daddy could do anything. But when terminal cancer took over his brain and he was faced with eternity, he needed God. He needed God to save him. We need God. We need God. You know, of the many songs on my hate list, I did it my way is probably my, every time I hear that song, it just rubs me the wrong way. Uh, No, no, no. Our way leads to death. We need God. We need God, and we show that by praying. Psalm 70 and 5 says, I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. You're my help. You're my deliverer. Don't delay. I must pray. I must pray. You must pray. We need God. And my last reason today, although there's probably many more, I think we don't pray because we don't have time. According to Gallup polls, nine and ten people pray regularly in the United States. Three out of four claim to pray every day. If you type prayer or pray in your internet search engine, expect to be wowed. It's over half a million hits. Places you can go to read about prayer. When people were interviewed about prayer, it's obvious. They view it as important, but it's more of a burden than a pleasure. Most spent five minutes or less in prayer, and most of the respondents to the survey said that they didn't feel God. Prayer ranks high in surveys for importance, but low in actual satisfaction. Disparity exists between prayer and theory, you know, that sweet hour of prayer, and practice. You know, we fidget after, you know, five minutes of reciting the same old prayer. Zondervan actually conducted a website poll recently. 678 responded, and only 23 of those 678 said they felt satisfied with their time in prayer. Time pressures crowd out the slowdown pace that prayer requires. Communication keeps getting shorter and shorter. Anybody in here like me? We've gotten so addicted to texting that if my phone rings, sometimes, honestly, I'm almost irritated. I'm like, why are you calling me? Why don't you just text? It's bad, isn't it? 
that. Shorter and shorter text messages, emails, instant, instant messaging. Less and less time for conversation. Less time for conversation. We have the constant sensation of not enough time. Several years ago, many years ago, Jesus rebuked me, and I have tried. I've failed many times, but I have tried to stop saying, I don't have enough time. I mean, he really worked me over about it. And you know what he told me? He said, I made time. And here you are saying you don't have enough. I made it. If I made it, it's enough. If your day needed 24, 25 hours in it, I would have given you 25 hours. We have to manage. We have to be a steward of our time. Anybody besides me amazed at how quickly time passes when you're, uh, you know, reading your favorite author or vacationing or you just fill in your blank there. <laughs> we have time. God gave us what we need. We have to put prayer on the calendar. Write it in. Keep it like you would an appointment. Nobody in here is going to miss an appointment of something important in your life. And there's nothing more important. I told you last night, there's nothing more important than conversation with God of the universe. Put it in your calendar. Do it every day. We like to say I'm a servant of God, but real servants, real servants know they're not the owner. And if we are really servants of God, we know that time is God's, and we must treat our time as his. It's not my day. It's not my 24 hours. It's his, and I need to manage it. If prayer is the place where God and humans meet, we must pray. Psalms 27 and 8 says, When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said, Thy face, Lord, I will seek. His word says, Seek my face. May our hearts say, Your face, Lord, I want to seek. It shouldn't be, How often, how long do I have to it should be Psalms 5 and 3. In the morning, we should feel, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. And we'll look up. Throughout the day, it should be Ephesians 6 and 18. Praying always, always, always. Wherever you go, whatever you do, search for reasons to pray. James 5 and 13 says, If you're sad, pray. If you're happy, sing praises. That pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? Pray. And David closed his day, Psalms 4 and 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, makest me dwell in safety. Prayer should be an ongoing conversation from the time we wake up. Honestly, I, you know, I'm getting to that point in my life when I wake up. I mean, that's my, my voice goes to him. Thank you, God. Thank you for the night's rest. If I didn't sleep well, it's, you know, God, it wasn't such a great night, but thank you for a new day. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new today. All through the day, look for opportunities to pray. Look for opportunity. And at night, the last words on our lips should be, thank you, God. I can lay down and rest because you're faithful. You know what? Today, I said last night, words upon words upon words have been spoken about prayer. <laughs> And I have just contributed another 30 minutes to all the words about prayer. But I'm going to flip the negative to a positive now. We pray because he hears us. We pray because we need him. And we pray because we have time. I have the solution, Pastor, for why we don't pray. You know what the solution is? Pray. Pray. God bless you, folks. Amen. As you stand today, let me just ask a very simple question. Imagine 
you had a hip condition. You damaged your hip, and you could barely walk, but you had to work. You had to function. You had to make a living to feed your family. What if someone had provided for you a wonderful device known as a walker? It would take the weight where you could move forward without pain and you could complete your day. But what if you only acknowledged it when you got ready to go to bed? You went through the whole day without it. Here's bedtime. I don't do much walking in my sleep. What are you saying today? We are all broken. Did you know that? We all have physical limitations. Now, some people think religion is a crutch. It is as natural and as necessary as oxygen itself. I'm saying this for a reason today. The Lord has provided prayer that we would not dread it, but that we would embrace it. How come we want to pray our good night prayers before we go to sleep? Because we're afraid we're going to die in our sleep, I guess. When the Lord wants to be with us every step of the day to sustain us. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about me. Is your pastor who has an agenda. My agenda is this, that we would quit looking at prayers. What I have to do and make it what I get to do. I get to talk to the creator of the universe. The one who knows more about me than anyone else. Who knows what's in my tomorrow and even what I dealt with in my yesterday you have a desire to just kind of apply what you've been taught in a beautiful fashion today for just a moment would you step out of your seat but I got places to go can't think of a better place to go today than to the Lord would you just break out of your tradition and your routine and would you just find a place to talk to the Lord as the praise team sings would you would you just stretch out? If you can't come here, just lift your hearts and your minds to the Lord today and talk to Him. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. 